Hello guys and gals to another top 10 video. As you may happen to know I really love making these and recently I've been looking at some of the worst consoles ever. Nowadays we have a pretty close set of consoles. The Xbox, Playstation, well anything Nintendo releases. We have three consoles and that's really it, but back in the day a plethora of consoles existed. Literally everyone and their grandmother made a system. And the problem was that 95% of them were total and utter crap. Oh yeah. And this video is going to show you 10 of the systems out of the many that ended up being the top of this shit heap. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the top 10 worst consoles of all time. This console hell spawn, crafted by Tiger Electronics and released in March 2005, Carl Freer, the founder and CEO, touted it as a response to the Nokia N-Gage. Cause you know, that was such a raving success, right? This 7th generation era console didn't come without a valiant attempt though. No, it was ad advertised in the British Formula 1 and god knows where else, and had some kick-ass exclusive titles such as Grand Theft- sorry, Colors, Trailblazers, Mama Can I Mow the Lawn, and Sticky Balls, which was the best-selling game by the way, proving that Gizmondo definitely did keep it sticky. The system came with a 400 megahertz processor and about 128 megabytes of RAM. Now those may not seem like much, but at the time they were somewhat beefy specs. And not only that, but it had a built-in camera. The ability to play movies at 240p, music playback at ear-destroying pitches, and a GPS locator which meant not only could you play your raving copy of Sticky Balls, but also get lost somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Truly Gizmondo, or Gizmondo, or whatever the hell they want to call themselves, knew where it was at. The system also had a new method of selling systems too, where it would ship with a cheaper version for about $230. Yes, $230! With smart ads. Now who'd want to buy ad space here? That's an IRL creepypasta on its own right there. But regardless, the system ended up failing not just because of a lack of quality games, but because it just couldn't compete with much better systems like the Nintendo DS and the Sony PlayStation Portable. The system would have a second system called the Gizmondo, G Gizmondo, whatever, widescreen. But apparently the company went bankrupt before this went into fruition. Thank the Lord. Oh, did you know that Carl Freer also ran a stolen Ferrari Enzo? Out of nowhere too? Yeah, that happened. The N-Gage. The inspiration for the uh, Gizmondo gets, I don't know, I'll never figure it out. The Nokia N-Gage is one of the most r notorious consoles that earns a spot on our list due to not just its concept failing, both concepts, but also basic design and even the games library. Developed by Nokia and released in October of 2003, this device was used to compete with the Game Boy Advance. Yeah, good luck! But giving cell phone functionality, allowing players to play games like Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, or I guess what appears to be Chaos Theory, and make crank calls to whoever they please. This and the successor, the N-Gage QD, had some really awesome games on it to be fair, like The Elder Scrolls Travel, and even Red Faction kind of made its way over to the handheld too. Huh. The device also allowed online gaming. <laughs> online gaming. <laughs> via Bluetooth and the internet and allowed MP3 playback. Yet to switch the games, get this, by taking off the back cover and battery. Really? Really now? And you know how much you paid for it? $300! With a device that couldn't be either a phone or a gaming device, led to believe that it literally looked like a taco connected to your ear when you were talking. No wonder this thing never sold. In fact, it got outsold by the Game Boy Advance 100 to 1. 100 to 1. That was the end gauge, ladies and gentlemen. But we get far worse. Coming next on our list is... The Philips CDI would end up sending you back about $700 to $1,500. And by inflation today, that would have been over $2,000 and above. $2,000 fucking dollars. What did you get for $2,000, you might ask? Well, you got CD-ROM drives. Yeah, oh, and an interactive multimedia device. Well, that's two counts of false advertising right there. Instantly showcased the future of a slow, clunky UI and the infamous YouTube 144p resolution with a cinematic 15 frames a second. Both Sony and Magnavox also joined the uh, CDI race, which skewed the sales as well if you really had to count it. There was also an add-on for an additional $150 on top of what you paid for if you wanted to <clears throat> browse the internet. Check your emails and play some games online, because you know, that's totally something that wanted to be done on this bad boy. Short story ended up becoming a commercial failure, one that again, Sony and Magnavox jumped into to create their own CDIs. 
Launch titles consisted of games such as Connect 4. Yeah, you know, for about $700 to $1,500, Connect 4 is definitely a hot software product on this game. Amazing. It later came out with amazing, really, really brilliant titles such as Link the Faces of Evil and The Flowers of Robert Maplethorpe, showcasing exactly what the system was capable of. Jack shit. The system showcased a, f a lot of full motion video in games. Games like Dragon Lair ended up being the best example, and you know, that wasn't a bad game when you think about it. And this ended up being the selling point of the console. Low resolution, choppy video. The system ended up getting tons of negative accolades, too bad, because if it had a killer title, you know, like Plumbers Don't Wear Ties, it might have sold. But next up on our list is... Yes, ladies and gentlemen, even Apple decided to take a look at the console market. But before the Apple TV, which, you know, again, wasn't a console, there was the Apple Pippin. Yes, crafted after one late night at a bar with Apple and Namco Bandai and our old friend Jack Daniels, and coming after one too many shots was the Apple Bandai Pippin, releasing in 1995 for about $600. Armed with a whole 66 megahertz of processing power, a whole 6 megabytes of memory, and get this, 14.4 kilobytes of power, and turn out only do you get suboptimal experience with all gamers, but you'll also enforce terrible lag when playing any game. Gee, when you think about it, for $600 you get something with a little bit more power, considering what else was out. Fewer than 100,000 were manufactured, and less than half of those even got sold, with about 80-something few games in Japan. No, not America, we got about 18 games here. Such as Exotic Sushi, and Navigator, Racing Days, and... <laughs> Compton's Interactive Encyclopedia. It had a plethora of accessories like this monstrosity and an ADB adapter to connect this thing to a Macintosh. What sets this apart was the fact that, for an exorbitant amount, it had little to no games with it, and half of them weren't even games or must-want titles, with the exception of, say, a Gundam's Tactic title and, I guess, an anime designer for Dragon Ball Z. One title, such as Terror Tracks, was pretty much a bad FMV game, and it's not like the haha, it's funny, bad, it's, well, no, we're talking bad really bad. Even with getting developers like Bungie on board with titles like Marathon, the console lived a lengthy lifespan of two whole years. Yeah, good going Apple, good, good, good GG! The console was also a little shining light of Apple's openness with hardware at one point, but ever since uh, the tech giant just returns to its closed platforms, maybe with some very good reason now. Now, not exactly a console, but rather an addition, was the N64 disk drive. Released in 1996 to Japanese audiences, never to anyone outside, this bad boy allowed the N64 to use 64 me megabyte magnetic disks for expansive storage, and allowed the system to give games a real-time clock function in an always active game world. It even allowed users with certain software to create animations and movies and even connect it to a service called RANnet to do some media sharing and online gaming. Now, that's a pretty common theme with these systems, huh? Except this time the service carried this $25 subscription cost per month. It was kind of cool at the time, since you could not only battle people online, but you could actually watch uh, it would appear to be streams from other players, and allow you to even beta test certain games and levels. So all in all, it wasn't bad, but the fact it faced very little support, even from the first party, who pretty much worked against it. It was a way to fight against the fact that the competition, PlayStation, could store 700 megabytes worth of that on a cheap CD versus an expensive card that could hold only 64 megabytes. Even the discs for this add-on could only do 64 megs as well, so with only 128 megs of total capacity offered to games with this add-on and cart, you couldn't compete with the PlayStation which offered games like Final Fantasy VII requiring three whole CDs. You can't fit that on carts with super compression, it's not possible, but regardless, it was an attempt, and games were made for this like Ocarina of Time, or I guess attempted to, but were scrapped for just use on a cartridge once this became a failure. This would be an absolute nightmare to develop for if you really thought about it. It was intense, and with a price of $90, it was tougher to adopt to many homes, along with the fact that it just didn't have too many games, leading the N64 DD to Doom, and one of the worst consoles of all time, or rather, add-ons here. The Studio 2 is more of an earlier Pong type machine, and you may wonder why this is on the list. Well, it was one of the consoles that really brought on the switchable ROM carts and came with several types of games beyond Pong, such as Tennis and Speedway and Gunfight. Alright, not so inventive, but they were different, and the system stood up to the likes of the Atari and failed. Fail it did. It was released for only 10 months and ended up kicking the bucket, leaving over 100 people laid off due to its failure, and most likely pushed RCA closer to its relatively close status of defunct. 
The naming was even off too, there wasn't really a Studio One, but aside from that, what was it like? Well, it had two keypads, literally two keypads, no joysticks, so imagine playing that with somebody. The design was stupid enough to include the power and video in one cable. Yeah, really great idea there. Five built-in games such as Doodle and Addition. Fucking Addition. Some believe that it was a failure due to the lack of color graphics other systems had at the time, but really with the system so conceptually retarded, it made sense for it to fail, and the fact that playing it, especially with another person, would be pretty uncomfortable. It made sense for something like the RCA Studio 2 to fail. But analysts would be right, since right off the bat, the system was a failure upon launch when it gets, got completely demolished by the Atari 2600, technically. All in all, a failure in every regard, but let's move on next in our list. Number 4. The Atari Jaguar When the bit wars were raging between the gaming platforms back in the day, the Atari Jaguar attempted to stand on top of the heat by offering 64 bits, even going as far as to use the slogan, do the math. Really, do the math, because here's the secret. It wasn't really 64 bits. It just used two 32-bit processors in tandem and added that up to 64 bits. Yeah, not really. But this system intended to offer some quality 64-bit titles such as Nagging Simulator and Bubsy. But all jokes aside, it did have the best version of Doom on it. In the end, the system had one hell of a controller. Seriously, it's like the Gizmondo and the N-Gage had a one hell of a night together. The console retailed for about $250 and was marketed to just New York and San Francisco, and because of this lack of advertising, it failed to attain a user base, and the system tanked commercially. The console didn't get too many games due to a lack of developer interest, but some good ones made it to the system such as Alien vs Predator. But also due to the fact that the system had several hardware flaws which caused the system to not have an attractive land for development, and eventually the system just dies out. Atari promised several components and add-ons, and the only one to be released was the Jaguar CD, but the rest would have been a virtual reality headset and dial-up modem for online gaming, so hold on to those AOL discs everyone, Cybermorph is going to have some online support. Sorry, nagging simulator. In the end the system failed commercially, but still holds a candle to some ROM hacking and homebrew communities far and wide. Next on our list. Now this is something a lot of people remember quite vividly. Back in the day, Tiger Electronics would release a metric ton of these low-end gaming systems that had LCD screens that projected some sprites on it that didn't show any animations and whatnot, and the background graphics were the nicest JPEGs they could find on Google Images, print out and put it behind an LCD screen. Amazing, right? So now, what if I told you they decided to create, and essentially, the same project, but mimic the Virtual Boy, and try to copy it? What do you think? Stupid? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Fucking stupid. It would consist of a headset, and to be fair, it beats the Virtual Boy here. And this would be connected to a controller. Now, the games were the same LCD cartridges and had no real programming to them, but for the most part, because of this, nearly every game was the same in its gameplay, despite having games like Virtual Fighter, which by the way sucked as you can get, and play similar to games like Batman and Men in Black. I don't know how, but whatever. The controller had far more buttons than I think were ever needed for any game this would offer. So essentially it was like the Virtual Boy, but less featureful, but more usable. XPG, or Extreme Pocket Game Model, came out allowing you to, <laughs> get this, mirror to reflect the you know, the uh, projection to your eyes. Yeah, so you can probably assume why this didn't sell it much. Uh, wonder if Tiger Electronics thought the same too. Probably not, but next on our list is... What list wouldn't be complete without this bad boy? Now this is Nintendo's most infamous, incredibly notorious failure known as a Virtual Boy. This bad boy, see, even without, even just looking at that picture, you can tell why it failed. Now this was meant to throw you into the game, and obviously with no proper headgear, what the hell are you gonna do? But then again, would you even want to, because within 3.14 seconds, you're gonna ruin your retinas guaranteed. Now you might ask, well, for those few seconds, Mudahar, do I get thrown into virtual reality? Yes. Yes you do. If your perception of virtual reality is red and black, here you go. And you get a bunch of games as well, literally a bunch, because in Handful of Reality, of 22 games were released, 14 of them being just in North America, and one of them was Waterworld. Waterworld. There were other games like Mario Tennis, Wario Land, and the really fun Telerail Boxer. Other than that, they were largely forgettable and it wasn't worth ordering a Virtual Boy over. There were some unreleased games such as GoldenEye 007, <laughs> imagine playing that, fuck me. The system would stand aside the Sega Saturn and the PlayStation and because of, <laughs> because of that, <laughs> And because of the way it was placed and the lack of head strap, it wasn't exactly portable, and even with the head strap, you look like a total tool walking with this in the public. Not to mention completely unsafe. It was priced around $180, and it may have been... 
kind of recently priced as a console, not really. It didn't stand up to the Game Boy, which was much cheaper and far superior to the device. Not only did this kill eyeballs and have a lack of games, it was just poorly thought out, and no wonder why this was a commercial failure for the company. It kind of did get a rebranding in the 3DS, and I guess in a way, eye-killing pleasure, but over there in the 3DS land, it's far better, and hell, that console is like the exact opposite of this one. You may wonder why the Virtual Boy isn't on the top spot. Well, it's not the worst. There's something far worse out there. Far more sinister. Some say this device is used to, to torture war criminals. Some would much rather offer their firstborn to never see it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is LJN Video Art. Those three letters anyone is accustomed to if you've been gaming for a while. LJN is the company you look at and begin to cry because that inexplicably states that the game you just got is nothing but a steaming pile of shit that makes Action 52 look like a godsend. The system build is educational, <laughs> joke right, would allow children to play games such as A Trip to the Zoo, On the Move, My Dream Day, and other games, hell that have the jingle. Used to keep searching for something to see, then my mom, she got smart, she got me video art. Clearly your mother never loved you if she went out to get that. It really had games dealing in coloring books and whatnot, and being an educational game system would somewhat excuse it from this list, but it doesn't. It's a game console. Do the leapfrog at better games. The system functionality would essentially be MS Paint, and that's about it. Hell no, I'm not letting it slide. No matter what game you got for the system, it was literally an electronic coloring book, and the worst kind too, because you couldn't even control it right. The joystick was never designed for it and optimized either, so when, so the only thing it was engineered to do failed. And it failed miserably! In fact, if you were going to make this better, I, I can't believe I'm actually saying this, put actual LJN games developed for the other systems on it, and maybe it might be fun. I mean, as fun as ripping your own eyeballs out, that is. And that ordinary gamers is it. My top 10 worst consoles of all time. I really love doing these, and I implore you to give me more topics and cover below in the comments. If you like what you saw, then please like, comment, and subscribe for more content. And check out what else we got uploaded. Once again, this is my own top 10 list, and it may differ from yours, so if you have your own, share it with us below, and we can all have a little bit of fun, provided we're not playing these systems, that is. But that's all for today, so as always, this is me, Mudahar, and I'm out.